In today's video, I'm going to build an NFC card reader for use in Home Assistant. We'll assemble the parts together on a breadboard, we'll install the ESP home code, and then what we'll do is we'll actually scan some brand new tags into Home Assistant, and then we'll use those to create some automations based on the scanning of those tags. So hang around. Hi, and welcome to Resin Chem Tech. Now, tags and NFC scanning has been around in Home Assistant for a few years now. I just never implemented it because I hadn't really had a good use case. And you don't actually have to build a tag reader to use NFC tags in Home Assistant. In fact, all you really need is a modern cell phone. These almost all have NFC scanners in them. And by installing the Home Assistant companion app on this, you can scan and use NFC tags in Home Assistant without building a reader. However, these are ideal for situations where you might have a single tag that you want to scan with multiple devices. In my particular case, I have multiple tags that I want to scan with one device. That's because my use case is I want to be able to select different streaming services down in my home theater area just by tapping a card to a reader. I'm not going to cover use of the mobile app in terms of scanning tags today. What we're going to look at is building our own reader that we can scan multiple tags. Now this work is based heavily on a user called Adano, and I'll leave a link to that down in the video description. But I'm gonna make a few changes to that. And he also sells a pre-built version. So if you don't wanna build your own, you can just simply buy one of those from him. But of course, this channel is all about DIY, so we're going to build our own. In addition, remember the video description will contain links to all the parts that I use, and there'll be a written guide that has the ESP home code and wiring diagrams. So with that, let's get started. These are all the potential parts for this project. Now, some of these parts are optional and some of them came with the components that I purchased and I won't be using them. But to start is the PN532. This is the NFC card reader module. This is what's going to read our cards. It comes with one sample card, a key fob, which I probably won't use, but I'll keep it around. Some pin headers, but these are 90 degree pin headers and I'm gonna want a straight pin header. So we won't be using those. And it also comes with some DuPont jumpers. Again, I'll be putting everything onto a soldable breadboard. So I won't be using the DuPont jumpers, but you certainly could. The other thing we're going to need here is the Wemos D1 Mini. That's going to be our controller for this project. And we're going to run ESP Home on that. We need a USB power cable and some kind of USB wall plug or some kind of five volt source for our USB. That's the only thing that's required for this project. Some optional components I'm going to add to my build is going to give me both visual and audio feedback whenever a card is scanned. And to do that, I'm going to add an LED. Now, most of the other builds you see use a single WS2812B LED pixel. And that's fine if you happen to have a strip of LEDs sitting around where you can cut a pixel off. But it seems kind of silly to buy a whole uh, three foot strand of LED pixels just to cut one off and use it. So as an alternative here, I'm gonna use a common anode RGB LED. You can get these for under a dime uh, in a pack of 100. So they're, they're very cheap. I happen to be using a diffused one just because I happen to have some of these left over from another project and I like to use what I've already got. I will have to add a resistor to that, but again, the cost of a resistor is next to nothing. So that's going to give me audio feedback. Another reason I'm using the RGB uh, LED here instead of this pixel is I'm actually going to have a black enclosure and in most cases you'll see that they just simply put the pixel underneath the cover and it shines through and if I was using white that pixel would work fine but it doesn't work with the black and for wife uh, approval factor reasons I need to have a black enclosure so for that reason I'm going to use this standalone common anode LED with a small hole in my enclosure now you can use even a single color LED and that would be even cheaper yet. But this is gonna give us both visual and audio feedback. For the audio, in most cases, other installs use a buzzer. I kind of find that buzzing sound a bit annoying. So I'm actually gonna use a vibrating motor here. This is a kind of vibrating motor you would find in something like a cell phone. And I think that's gonna give me enough of a rattle on this to give me that audio feedback as well. And I will be putting all of the components on this electro cookie soldable breadboard and within the case itself. Yes, I did custom print a 
uh, 3D case, but that is optional. Again, there are project boxes and things available on Amazon or dollar soap dishes, other things you can use for an enclosure. But again, a lot of this is optional. In all honesty, if I move everything out of the way, the only thing we really have to have for this project is that. And again, uh, either you either need some header jumpers if you want to use DuPont cables, or you can use short ones, runs of wire and wire everything, everything direct. That's all you have to have for this project. Everything else is technically optional. Cost-wise, the PN532, you can can pick it up for definitely under $10. The D1 minis can be had for well under $3 and a couple of bucks, you know, for a charger in this. So the whole project should be under 20, maybe even under $15. Now odds are you're going to want to buy some additional cards. Just having one card kind of defeats the purpose, but these NFC cards can also be had for less than a dollar a piece, especially when you buy them in quantity. Taking a look at the PN532 module, there is one thing that we need to set on here before we wire this up. The PN532 module actually has three different communication protocols. It can communicate over UART, I2C, or SPI. We're going to use I2C here, and to tell it which communication method we're going to use, we have to set these little dip switches. There's a little tiny chart here on the side that lets you know, but for I squared C, we need dip switch number one turned on and dip switch number two turned off, which is the way I've got it set here. For our I squared C communication, we're going to need four wires. We're going to need five volts and ground, a data line, and a clock line connected to our ESP8266. Since I'll be mounting mine on an electro cookie board, I am going to solder straight pin headers onto those four. If you want to use something like DuPont connectors, you can use this 90 degree angle that comes with it or you can actually solder your wires directly th into the through holes on the board itself. And of course, before we do a soldered version, I always like to do a full breadboard test. It's a little bit easier to see the wiring here as well, which I'll cover briefly. Got our card reader here hooked up to five volts and ground. Our clock line is hooked up to D1, which is GPIO5, our data line to D2, GPIO4. I've got my common anode LED, which is connected to 3.3 volts going through what I'm using is a 10K resistor here. A red leg is hooked up to GPIO2 or D4, green to D5, which is GPIO14, and the blue to D6 or GPIO12. My buzzer over here is connected to a GPIO15, which is D8, and it is also connected to ground. So that's it for the connections. But of course, before we can actually test this, I've got to put ESP Home on to the Wemos D1 Mini. For ESP Home, we're actually going to be using some code developed by a user named Adano. He's written a really nice uh, YAML ESP Home node for the tag reader. Now, there are multiple ways to get this into your ESP Home. You can copy the YAML over to your ESP Home folder. What I opted to do was go ahead and create a new node over here called Tag Reader. In my case, I named it Tag Reader Basement. And then we can flip over to the GitHub repo from Adano for the Tag Reader. And we could just take this and we're simply going to copy all that. And we're going to paste that over back over into our ESP Home node. Now, there's a few things that you may want to modify in here. For one thing, putting in your Wi-Fi uh, credentials and passwords. I changed a few things in terms of uh, friendly names that I used. The only thing that I had to change was I did have to come down here and put in the switch for my buzzer, which is right here, my, or my vibration motor. And of course I did have to come down and I had to substitute my uh, common anode LED instead of the WS2812B pixel. If you're using those other components, you can pretty much just copy and paste this right into ESP Home. Once you've saved your changes, then you can come back over to your main ESP Home dashboard. I do like to go ahead and do a quick validate just to make sure that I haven't uh, had any typos in there, any problem with my YAML. As long as I get the screen check mark, we're good to go. So now I can click install. In this case, I actually have taken my breadboard or my ESP D1 Mini and I've plugged it into this computer. So we're going to select that option. Now, the first thing it's going to do is ask you to download the project. I've already done that. So now I can just select Open ESP Home on the web, select Connect, select the right COM port, and now I can click in this Install. And now I'm gonna simply go back out and choose that file. 
There it is. It should be a bin file. I'm going to open that. And I'm going to go ahead and click install. Now I should connect to my D1 Mini. So it's going to erase the flash and then it's going to upload. This is going to take a couple minutes, so we will jump through this. Okay, our installation is finished. So now we can simply close this. We see that we're connected. We could actually look at the logs if we like to, to look at those just to make sure everything is fine and everything looks good. So now we can go back to ESP Home. Okay, I've hooked all my components back up to my breadboard. In Home Assistant to manage tags, we're gonna come over here to settings and go to tags. As you can see, I don't have any tags defined yet. This is brand new, it'll be the first time I've tried it. So what should happen, I'm gonna take a brand new card here, stick it in front of the tag reader. Hopefully we'll see the LED come on to let us know that the tag was red, my vibration sensor ought to go off, and we should hopefully see a tag pop up in Home Assistant. There we go. That worked perfectly. So there is our first tag. Now you might not have been able to see it too well, but my LED did light up in green and my vibration sensor did vibrate. Now the one thing I would like to do with these, because you always get these random numbers, which is gonna be kind of hard to remember, I'm gonna come in here and give this a new name and update that. So now I can use this in my automations. So with the breadboard test complete and everything working, it's now time to take this and basically move that all over to this electro cookie board and put it inside our enclosure. I didn't want to make you watch the agony of me doing all of the soldering, but this is my final soldered version. It pretty much just follows the, the wiring diagram that I shared before. It had to be a little bit tricky to get everything organized onto this board, and I had to lay mine out for my enclosure. So I have my hole for my LED here. But since I do have these mounting posts in here for the electro cookie board, it does allow me to do a lot of the wiring on the underneath side of the board. So you can route the wires however you like. My little vibration sensor is going to attach to the lid of my enclosure. So I will just stick that on there. But that's really all there is to it. It's the same connections that you had on the breadboard, same as the wiring diagram. You just have to be a little bit creative with how you run your wirings depending on the type of enclosure you're going to put your board in. Here's the final assembled box. It is about as thick as a deck of playing cards. The only wire that we're gonna have coming out is our USB connection here. And if we wired everything correctly, all we should have to do is tap a card to this part of the box to be able to read it in Home Assistant. So my card reader is now hooked up and I've gone ahead and printed some labels and put them on some NFC cards here. We're going to try this out. This is the one that I did the original test for, so it should already be showing there in Home Assistant. So when I scan this one, the last scan over here ought to update from two days ago. So let's just tap that. And there we go. See it lit up. I can definitely hear and feel a little bit of the vibration there. And we see that tag has now been scanned. So I'm going to go ahead and just change the name on that just to keep things consistent here so I don't forget. So we'll update that. And now I can just start to scan additional cards. So I'll scan the next one. And we see that that popped in a brand new card. So once again, I will just go ahead and rename that one. Call this one Netflix. Update that. And now all I've got to do is go ahead and scan the rest of my cards. Now with all of my tags defined here in Home Assistant, I can now use those as triggers in automations. So let's go back and go over to our automations, create an automation, create a new one. Now for our trigger, you'll notice there's an option here for tag. When I select that as my trigger, I can drop this list down and I can see all of those tags that I just defined. So I simply select one of those and now I can add conditions and whatever actions you would normally want, whether that be to turn on a light or set a scene. In my case, I actually have scripts defined for all these services. So all I really need to do is I just need to call a service and I just need to simply run one of my pre-existing scripts. But again, you can do this for pretty much anything. There's Roku TV. And that's all I have to do. Now, anytime I scan that tag, it's automatically going to run this script. But you could use this again for music playlists, to set scenes, to control lights, to do really any kind of action or anything that you normally would do in an automation when you scan a particular tag. And if you happen to be a YAML guy like I am, because I like to keep all my automations in packages, not one in one great big automation.yaml file, here is that same automation done in YAML. 
Again, our trigger in this case is going to have a platform of tag, and I have to specify the tag ID. Now, at the time of this recording, unless there's something that I'm missing, you actually have to use that tag ID. You can't use the friendly name. Now, if you don't remember the tag ID, it's easy to get. Go back to your tags, click the little gear icon, and it'll pop up a box and will actually give you the tag ID. Now, there's one other option here that you can do in YAML is you can specify a device ID. That means theoretically I could run a different automation if I used a different device to scan the same tag. Where do you get the device ID? Well, if you go to your dev tools, go over to events and subscribe to the event tag scan and scan a tag, it will pop up and show you the device ID. In my case, I'm not going to use a device ID in my trigger because I don't plan on scanning these tags with anything other than the reader that I just built. But then from there, you just like any other automation, call the action that you want. In this case, I'm calling that script to turn on YouTube TV. All right, I've created all of my automations. So let's give this one final try and you'll be able to watch the Home Assistant dashboard here. So I'm gonna start out by, right now the TV, the whole home theater system is off. I'm gonna scan this card and we can see that the Roku turned on and it did launch YouTube TV. So that is all working. Let's just try switching services. Let's go over to something like Paramount. Scan that card. And it does take a second here for the Roku to report back the change in service, but you can see that Paramount is now running. And note, I could have all kinds of other things in my automations, like lowering the lights, closing window shades, anything else is part of this, or these could all be various scenes that I wanted to set. So let's try one more here. Let's try launching Prime Video. Launch that and you can once again see that that service has now switched and Prime Video is running. And finally, let's say that all done for the night, ready to go to bed, let's just hit the power down, scans that, and again, it's going to shut everything off, power down the system, and there it goes. So everything is all working great. I'm ready to go install this in the final location and start using it. And after having it installed for a little while, Mrs. Resinchem reports this is now one of her favorite automations. So big wife approval points for me. So that's gonna do it for this video. Once again, don't forget to check the video description for more details. And if you saw anything in this video you like, do me a favor and hit that thumbs up button. If you'd like to see more of my content, consider clicking the subscribe button. And if you wanna be notified when I release new videos, ding that little bell icon. And as always, I'd like to say thank you for watching and I hope to see you soon.